What's up, everybody? It's Fish Sticks here. Today, I'm going to take you through how to play competitive tribes. This video will be applicable to any and all tribes, but I will be taking a particular look at Tribes 3. Let's break tribes down into its basic form. It's a capture the flag game. Each team has both an offense and a defense. The defense, their goal is to guard this flag. Offense's goal is to capture the enemy flag. This may sound basic, but I think it's actually worth calling out because it's different than most other first person shooters out on the market today. It resembles soccer or uh, football uh, in, if, if you're European. So you have an offense and a defense. I'm gonna start with offense first because I think it's a little bit more clear and a little bit easier to understand. Your main goal, of course, is this guy right here. I'm saying th this is us. We are the left side team. We wanna get this flag and bring it home. So how are we gonna do that? If you are familiar with tribes, you probably know the term lameing, which is just you walk up to the flag and walk home. That doesn't work, at least in a competitive setting. What you need to do instead is coordinate your offense. And that's because you're gonna have defenders right here on this stand that are waiting for you to come in and will stop you. And because they spawn fairly close to this base, they're gonna have an advantage. So what you need to do is you need to move quickly. Even if you're barely familiar with tribes, you know that it's a game about going fast. So this is where the fast starts coming in. We're gonna be talking about this with a seven versus seven in mind, just as a frame of reference. That is the game type that Prophecy has said is the competitive game type in, in tribes three. So we're gonna start thinking about this as seven v seven. Let's start to flesh out what different roles that you're gonna see on a 7v7 team might look like. I'm gonna start with number one, which is the capper. This is the guy whose job it is to go quickly and pick up the enemy flag and get home with incurring as minimal damage as possible so that they can get that flag home to their flag and put scores up on the, point, uh, uh, on the board. Um, in a game mode, I'm gonna say you want, you want at least two players going super fast capping. And the reason why I have them coming from different directions is because in general, you want to sync up to land on the enemy flag around the same time and generally from different directions. If they're both running the exact same left to right route or front to back route, you're gonna see them both coming pretty easily. Now, if you have them coming from different directions, it's gonna be a lot trickier. If you're just sending these two cappers and there's a good defender here like Jagel, he is going to midair both of you and you're both going to die. The best way to get this flag home is to first clear the flag stand. So this is capper, this is gonna be capper one, this is gonna be capper two. There's another common position in tribes called clear. In some games it's called light offense, medium offense, but I'm just gonna call it clear because their main goal is to clear the flag stand. And I'm, this is a light armor, most likely. This is a light armor, at least in traditional tribes games. Tribes three, medium armor is pretty damn good at capping. Traditionally, these are gonna be light armor. So the clear, I'm gonna say that's this guy. He's a little bit bigger, a little bit beefier. Typically medium armor, I'm gonna say clear. And his goal is to disrupt any of the enemies that are directly on this flag stand. In a traditional flag capping situation, the clear might show up, let's say, anywhere between five to 15 seconds before the cappers do, because his goal is to do as much damage as possible to these flag defenders, as well as just simply distract them. You might also call this a distract. I'm gonna give him a little disc launcher. So he's gonna be shooting primarily discs directly at the flag stand and clearing anyone who's right here. We're talking about 7v7. Right now, we really don't know what the meta is gonna be like in Tribes 3 at all, but my personal belief and the belief of most of the competitive players is that you're likely to see three on defense and four on offense. And this is actually reflected in pretty much every other tribes game. If you have an uneven number of players, then you're probably gonna have one more on offense and one more on defense. I'm gonna say this is a medium armor. And, and I should also say the clear, it's always good if your clear also is still a threat to grab this flag and take it home. If the defenders know that every single time they see the clear, all they're doing is clearing. They can essentially try and avoid them and just only look for the cappers or kill them as quickly as possible. So it's good and sometimes advisable for this medium armor to sometimes run routes as well or this clear to sometimes run routes as well so that they're always a threat. There's one more offensive player which is called the Ho. He's gonna be a big fatty. And I don't know why I'm putting him down here. Let's just say, let's just say he's sitting on a hill back here. 
This is the hoe. He's a big guy. Uh, this is ugly as sin. So this guy is the hoe. That's a heavy, I and mean, if that wasn't clear. He's got the mortar. He's got the big guns. And he's going to be raining mortars onto the flag stand as well. Now, there is one more aspect to tribes, which we haven't talked about, which is the generators. So I'm going to put the generator down here because it's usually in the base. His secondary job is to keep the enemy base down. There's also there's also going to be turrets and probably a sensor somewhere. Let's just say the sensor is back here. So the Ho has many jobs. He's trying to keep their base down, destroy the generator. He has many jobs. Destroy the generator, destroy the turrets, destroy the sensor. Mind you, the medium armor can also help with this. The medium clear can probably also help with this, especially in the first run. Right now in Tribes 3, it's questionable how important it is to focus on the base at all. Just being super honest about the current state of the game, the base isn't that impactful. But in general, you do want to probably clear it and, and destroy the enemy base in that first run. So this is what a typical offense looks like. You've got cappers, they're trying to time, time up as best as they can, so they're hitting the flag stand at the same time. The clear is doing their best to keep the flag defenders at bay, keep them distracted, or even kill them. The Ho participates in all of this, of course, killing the base, but also clearing the flag stand. Now we can talk about what defense looks like. So we have another big fatty, and he's gonna stand right on the flag stand. This guy is the Hoff, and that stands for heavy on flag. His job sounds is pretty self-explanatory. You are a heavy and you are standing on this flag. Of course, you also have a generator. And you also have turrets. You might spend some of your time, if you're a Hoff, trying to keep people away from this. So this Hoff might be spending some time focusing on his generator, repairing it if it goes down, if he has time, focusing on his turret and sensor. But I would say that's very secondary to sitting right here on the flag stand. And then you've got essentially two other defense positions. One is called a chaser. So I'm just gonna say chase, and one is called home D, home. What's the difference between chaser and home? Chaser's job is whenever his flag, his friendly flag gets taken from that base, he's gonna be the first one to chase that flag carrier and try and bring that flag home as, as quickly as possible. In tribes three, you have chaser perks. So he's probably gonna be running one of the chaser perks so that he can get a free disc jump whenever they take his flag. His flag gets taken, he's the first one on that ass. He's disc jumping, he's throwing concussion grenades, he's typically got a chain gun as well, because that's probably the, your best bet for stopping a flag carrier who's moving quickly. Home D is, a, is the opposite of a chaser. When his flag gets taken away from his base, he's probably still gonna stay there. Why would you stay there when your flag's not there? Your flag could get returned at any time, and if you don't have anyone home, that means that the enemy could have a llama lurking and you're gonna be kind of screwed, especially in Tribes 3, because the spawn points are so far away from the flag stand. If your flag gets llamaed, if there's somebody just waiting here and you don't have a home D to make sure that they're not gonna get away with that flag scot-free, it's gonna to be tough for you to respawn and get on the chase, although not impossible. Now, this is the position I'm actually most unsure about in Tribes 3, because you do have a Hoff, and the Hoff is not likely to necessarily be a great chaser. The Hoff might move in a standoff position. The Hoff might move to midfield. But I don't know if that Hoff is necessarily going to go all the way to the other base. So the Hoff might be able to play the midfield position a little bit and then re retreat to be a home D. Another thing to consider about Tribes 3 is I think more than any other Tribes game, it's viable to play midfield. And we see guys like Jagel basically playing, let's say he's like here most of the time, and he can move back and forth between the midfield because he's hitting midairs like a fucking monster, fucking Jagel. I'm not even sure that home D is, is the play in this game. It's kind of TBD. I don't really know. I'd be curious to hear what some of the uh, viewers in chat think about this. But So I'm not even sure that this, this class, this position exists. It might be a midfield. It might be a midfield. But Chase for sure always exists. Hoff almost right now, given the current meta. Yeah, for sure. I also will say that some of these positions, when I say L, when I say M, it's not 100% of the time because in Tribe 3, as of now, your cappers can be medium. Medium is an incredibly strong capping class and frankly, light is pretty weak right now. This is not meant to be totally prescriptive. You can have medium cappers, you could have 
I've seen people running two heavies on the stand. I've seen two two heavies. It's pretty tough when you have two heavies in Jagle. It's rough. None of this is set in stone, but I just wanted to break out some really basic principles for how to think about competitive tribes and how to how I would split out a 7v7 team. As you scale from 7v7 to 10v10 or 12v12, these things scale as well, of course. You might have three cappers and two clears. Three capper, you might go three cappers, two clears, two hoes, potentially even in a 7v7 or 12v12 or three cappers, two ho, one in one clear, something like that. You might go to two hoffs. You might, if it's 12v12, you might actually have a dedicated person just focusing solely on the turrets and the sensors and the bases. In previous tribes games, you had a position that was called turret farmer, which is not very relevant in this tribes game. In games like tribes one, tribes two, even tribes vengeance, not so much tribes ascend, there were so many different things that you could do around the base. You could deploy sensors. You could deploy de lots of deployable turrets. You could deploy deployable inventory stations in really strategic areas. There were more turrets and there were there was more base assets that were worth keeping up and worth looking at. You had inventory stations. In this game, you don't have any of that. The I don't think that the turret slash base focused person makes sense until maybe you get to 12v12. And even then, I don't think it makes sense to have someone completely focused on, on base assets. Turrets would be great if you could change the base turrets or the gens allowed you to change class on respawn. Yeah, I mean, we've been proposing a bunch of interesting ideas, in my opinion, about how to make the generator more important. I think one of the ideas we had was like, have a spawn point on the base that is reliant on the gen. If your generator was up, your defense could spawn on the base, and if not, they still had to spawn way back. I think that's an interesting idea. Maybe you could put perks behind the generator. If your per if your generator isn't up, then you don't spawn with a perk. That could be interesting. Home D is usually medium to help during the Hoff and has impact nitrons, which are OP. Yeah, right now, impact nitrons are so strong that even if you're not the chase, I think most likely you're gonna be running impact nitrons. There's really no reason not to have impact nitrons. Or gens up and respawn is six seconds if down, it's longer. Yeah, I think all of these make sense to me. I don't mind. I think they're cool. They are they make logical sense. I'm gonna just call this, I'm gonna call this home smid. Oh God, this is the ugliest shit ever. How do I make this bigger? I'm just gonna call this, oh, oops. It's the wrong thing. We're gonna call this mid. I actually like calling this midfield, to be honest, because that essentially means you're a home D, right? You're only you live in this area. This is the Jagle position. Jagle typically plays this. If you're, if none of your cappers get out, you can move forward and help with the chase and help with the clear and blah 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 blah. But if your friendly frag carrier does come home, then you're you're within this area, so you're going to be able to escort them and you're going to get be able to stay. You could use heavy for midfield. Yeah, yeah, heavy with portal. Yeah, yeah, you could certainly do heavy here, especially with the portal. That's true for sure. So this is basically what 7v7 looks like here. All right, class, let's recap. How do we play offense, chat? How do you run a successful offense? What is step number one in running a successful offense? I'm waiting. Special, I'm gonna give a star sticker to whoever gets this right first. What's step one in running a successful offense? Smirk says kill, okay. Gotta go fast. Okay, I, uh, we're getting there, we're getting there. How do we, let's put, how about we try and put those two things together? Let's put those two concepts together. Number one, kill. Good job, Smirk. Number two, hit clips. Gotta go fast. Thank you. Setup and communication. We're getting there, we're getting there. So what are you communicating about? What are we communicating about? I'm starting my route. I say, I'm starting a left route. Great. The other capper says, okay, great. I'm starting a right route. What's next? Routes, timing, where to concentrate fire. Must distract. Ding, ding. Casey Schiffel gets it first. Distract. This is the first guy in. Actually, these two are the first guys in. They're distracting the enemy flag stand. They're clearing the enemy flag stand. That's number one. Number two, communication with the cappers. I'm coming in left. I'm coming in. I'm coming in for a front route. I'm running a back route. I'm 10 seconds out. Please, how, what does the flag stand look like? Communicating with your other cappers. Let's say we're trying to coordinate, but I'm 10 seconds earlier. Okay, here's a quiz. Here's a pop quiz. Here's a pop quiz, chat. Class. 
Capper number one is 10 seconds earlier than Capper number one, two. He's charging towards the flag stand and there's a uh, one Hoff and one medium armor sitting right on it. What does Capper number one do? What does Capper number one do? Yes, DeFriend got it, DeFriend got it. Capper number one says, you know what? I'm 10 seconds earlier than Capper number two and there's still people on the stand. I'm gonna clear, I'm gonna help clear. If 10, he still has 10 seconds for his next capper to come in. So going for a grab here is likely gonna result in him dying. Now, when I give hard and fast rules, you always need to take them with a grain of salt because if you become too predictable on offense, it's not gonna go well for you. If you know that the first capper in always is going to stop and clear every single time, if you know that the first capper in is always going to clear, then you can start to adapt to that, right? He's always gonna clear. That means if I see one capper, I'm really looking out for the second capper. So it does make sense for no capper number one to sometimes go for the grab, even if the flag stand isn't clear, even if you're the first capper in. If you don't do that, then you, they know you're not a threat to grab the flag. This is why I think it's incredibly important to have more than one capper on your team. I even think that this medium or clear role should be capping some of the time. Because you also see their, you, you see their IFF, you see their name. So if, let's say, APC is clearing, every time you see APC, you're like, okay, he's going to be here 15 seconds before his cappers. Let's kill him as quickly as possible. Or frankly, just ignore him because he can't shoot shit. No, I'm just kidding. APC is a good player. So sometimes APC is also a capper. Blink pack can make you a cowboy, can make cowboy potential very strong. Yes, agreed. Blink capping. You can be super, super tricky, even if someone's on the flag stand, it's still possible. However, against good players, I think it's gonna, you're gonna have a hard time. You're gonna have a hard time. Okay, so hit clip says, number one, go fast. Two, number two, run interference. Number three, grab enemy flag. Number four, communicate positions. Number five, is your base safe? Return cap. Generally correct, generally correct. There's one other, one other core central concept to tribes, which I have not discussed yet. Can anyone guess what it is? What have I not discussed that you see every single game of Tribes? Not VGS, not Shazbot, not Shazbot. Good guess. What is one aspect of Tribes that happens? Not the Llama Grab, we did discuss that already. Chain Spam, that does happen, yes. I'm talking about the metagame between the two teams. What's a situation that's different than both flags being on the stand? Let's say both flags are in the field. What's that? Yes, hit. Hit Clips got it. The standoff. The standoff. Thank you, Hit Clips. Perfect. Hit Clips, would you like to explain what a standoff is? Or I can do it. Yes. When both teams are in possession of each other's flag, meaning that you cannot capture the flag. Now, I'm a. We don't. We haven't played enough pickups to really know exactly who's going to stay O and who's going to stay D. But in general, let's say Capper 1 gets the flag. He is all the way back here with the flag. Which out of these three defenders is going to stay home with him. Which out of these three defenders is going to stay home with the capper who brought the flag home? Yep, Hoff is number one, that is correct. Who else? If it's just the Hoff, that's two. That's only two people. You're gonna have a hard time. Medium chase is actually incorrect. Midfield, midfield slash home D, whatever we end up calling this position. Capper one makes it home with the flag. He's going to be holding that flag with these two. In the current meta for Tribes 3, you're most likely to pass it off to a Hoff or a Medium. Light can't duel for shit. Light cannot duel for shit in this game. So a Light Armor is very unlikely to be the one that's gonna be holding this flag. Also, by the time the Light Armor gets home, given the enemy team's defense did their job, he's probably gonna be pretty low. So he's gonna have to look to pass the flag off to either, most likely the midfield, but potentially as the Hoff as well. And then we enter what's called a standoff, where both teams are holding each other's flag. So in general, I'm going to assume that the meta for Tribes 3 is going to be three people hold the flag at home. That's gonna be the midfield slash home D, the Hoff, and the capper who brought it home. So whoever brings the flag home is generally going to stay home for that run. This isn't for any reason other than it's just easier to remember 
in theory, you could say, oh, we have this one player who's like much better at flag play and holding the flag and just understands that meta better. And then we have one player who's better at chasing and returning the flags. You might want to do that. But in general, whichever flag carrier brings the flag home is most likely the one that's going to also stay home during that during that flag, that standoff. Now, there is one more scenario with standoffs that I haven't talked about, which is rabbiting, which is actually very strong in Tribes 3 at the moment. If Capper 1 brings it home and they're doing well on health, they can just do, I'm just going to cruise around this map at really high speeds. And because the chasers have, a, have really weak disc jumps and they also have a hard time, they also have a challenging time with uh, air mobility. As long as you're moving fast and you know your routes, you can also rabbit. There is one downside to rabbiting, though. If you're cruising out in the map and you're avoiding all the defenders, what's the downside to rabbiting, Chad? Class, what's the downside to rabbiting in the field? Flag return takes longer to cap. Defriend got it. Nice. You get a gold star. Let's say you're rabbiting, your light capper is rabbiting in the field. He's scot free. He feels like he's doing a great job for his team. Then suddenly, his friendly chaser returns. So it's back at the stand. This guy, he's in no man's land. He might be going like 300 kilometers an hour this way. In Tribes 3, it takes a very long time to turn around. So it's going to take him 25 seconds. No, maybe not 25. It's going to take him 15 seconds to get back to the stand. That's enough time for the enemy team to get over and get his flag off, to get his flag off the stand. So in general, I prefer holding the flag. In, in general, in most tribes games, you're going to hold the flag pretty close to the flag stand. This is an extra guy. We don't need him. So yeah, if you have the flag, if you got the flag coming out your ass, you're probably going to stay relatively close to the flag stand for this reason. I am really curious to see what changes they make to base assets and the generator. Because if the generators and the base assets become more important, let's say they buff the turrets or they do one of these buffs or like they do one of these generator things that we talked about, like where you get a, maybe you get a closer spawn or you can't get your perk unless you have the generator up. I'm very curious to, how, to see how this changes the gameplay because then you're going to need somebody to repair it if it goes down. You're going to need to spend more time and effort making sure it does not go down in the first place. So whose job would that be? I feel like Hoff, he's, he doesn't want to leave this flag unless he knows he has, he might leave it for 10 or 15 seconds, but he's not going to spend a significant time uh, away from his flag. So I think if anything, it might be the midfield position to defend and repair a bit more often. Or alternatively, maybe one of the offense players is actually a defense player. Because right now we have four people on offense, three people on defense. Or maybe you have a float. Maybe there's a float player. Maybe it's this guy who actually alternates between killing their base assets, clearing the flag, and also keeping his own base assets up. I don't know. I don't think additional generator rules will apply in 7 versus 7. I generally agree. I think 7 versus 7 is... I think it's too few players to really want to dedicate anyone else to the base assets even if they were more important and critical to maintain than they are today i still don't know how much more of the gameplay is going to focus on that 12v12 totally different story 12v12 is a totally different story in 12v12 i think it could make sense to have maybe one person dedicated to keeping your base assets up that even in even with how even in today's meta i don't think that makes sense with 12v12 or capper repairs before making a run probably not because a, a good cap route takes, let's say, 25 to 35 seconds to set up. If you're Blitz, it might take 48 seconds or maybe 52 because that's how Blitz rolls. I love you, Blitz, if you're still in chat. So I don't think it's going to be the cappers. Any questions, chat? You're going to be quizzed on this tomorrow, so please take notes. Okay, so let's... I don't know how helpful this will be, but I'm doing a top-down view of a base right now. Most bases in not... Yeah, I would say like most bases in tribes games have a flag like in the middle and then either have either me make it either geometry here so you can't run front to backs or back to fronts super easily. You at least have to come from an angle or have 
I mean, in this game, they put like blocker, they put those weird blocks here, which I really dislike. The flag stand always has some difficulty getting to. In, in almost every single tribes map, there's some geometry, whether it's here, whether it's here, that limits your routes. But an effective offense, you want to have cappers coming from different directions. And let, I guess one thing to talk about is the different kinds of routes that you can run as well. So this is a, f let's say these are the flag stands. Oh God, that was the ugliest flag stand. It's even worse. Ugh. This is called a front to back route because you're like skiing into one bowl, coming up another, going down another bowl, and then you're just going straight into the flag stand. This is the fastest way to run a route because it is the dr most direct way to run a route. But what is the issue? What is the problem with running a front to back route? What is the problem with running a front to back route, chat? Why is it not the best kind of route? The return home takes longer. Defran, you are getting so many silver stars, my dude. You're getting so many silver stars. In general, front to back routes suck in tribes games. I wouldn't say they suck. It depends on the map. In some cases, let's say Stonehenge from earlier tribes games, there's a giant bowl in the back that can reroute you really well. But in most cases, a front to back is going to have the longest return time because you have to fully change your momentum and come all the way back. But the benefit of a front to back route is that it takes the least time to run and the least time to set up. Some players actually prefer doing as many front to backs as possible because that means more shots on goal. You're going to have more chances to get the flag home. Left to right and right to left are like the middle ground. More time to set up, less time to get home because you don't have to turn your momentum all the way around. So this is what you call left turn when you leave the flag stand. As a capper, you'd say, I'm running a left turn. I'll be there in 25 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever. When you're here, you say, I'll be there in 15 seconds. When you're here, you say, I'll be there in five seconds, etc. Communicate with your team, very important. What's the next kind of route? F, two, B, L, two, R. What's the last kind of route you can run? Back to front. Exactly. One more gold star for Defren. And would somebody not named Defren like to tell me why you would run a back to front and why you, what are the benefits, what are the pros and cons of running a back to front? Get back home fast. And of course, this is medium setup. This is shortest setup, shortest, medium, longest. If you're setting up a back to front, regardless of what tribes game you're playing, it's probably 30 to 45 seconds to set that up. So in general, I would say, I, I'm, I'm just gonna pull these numbers out of my ass and it also totally depends on the map, but I'm gonna say in general, 60% of your routes, roughly, let's just say roughly, should be left to right to left. I would say maybe 25% should be front to back and then 15 should be back to front. Back to fronts are very risky because if it doesn't work out, you wasted 45 seconds running a route. Your entire team was waiting for you. But the benefit, of course, is if you get that shit, if you grab that flag, you'll be home in 10 seconds or less, depending on the map, depending on the tribe's game. This is obviously, this to again, totally depends on the map, totally depends on the game, totally depends on your what you like to do. I, I would say if you're having no trouble whatsoever grabbing the flag, you can just run front to backs all day. If these defenders are whack, let's say you've got APCs defending, you're like, this guy sucks. We got APC in the chat still. I'm just gonna keep running front to backs because you're just gonna get out and you're gonna get home. But if you're having a lot of trouble getting the flag off the stand, you might wanna start running faster, better routes. And there are also many kinds of left to right routes in front. There's, there's variations, right? You could, there are weak left to right routes that are just the fastest possible left to right route. And then there are like power, I think some people call them like power routes, like I'm going to run some power routes, which is, let's say a normal left to right takes 25 to 30 seconds to set up, a power right, left to right might take 35 to 40 seconds to set up. In general, a back to front will take 45 to 50 seconds to set up, depending, I'm pulling all these numbers out of my ass, but you get what I mean. But in general, if you aren't getting the flag off the stand often, it might make sense to set up a really nice back to front and have all of your clearers, all of your chasers, really clearing for this one guy. Because if one of your cappers is running weak routes, the other capper is running strong routes, you really, most of the focus is on the strong. 
chat any questions chat any comments anything you'd like to add any concerns how do i ski ah of course of course the most basic of tribe skills that i completely overlooked i completely overlooked how could i do that what is ski what is ski <clears throat> Why am I bad at the game? Have you been playing Tribe since 1999 like I have? I'm still bad, but a lot of us have been playing for 20 years. Or 25 years, in my case. Where's snow? All right, skiing fundamentals. Let's talk about skiing. This is what a typical Tribes map looks like. This is exactly a spitting image of a typical Tribes map, believe it or not. I'm gonna, I'm channeling Greth here, guys. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go full Greth on you guys if you don't stop me. Well, the best, the, the most, there's two fundamental parts, two fundamental pieces to skiing. One, number one, jet regenerating pack. This is your resource. Number two, frictionless boots. Actually, I'm gonna do number three. Number three, I should be a teacher, this is fun. I like this. Number three, gravity. You can use one, if you use one, two, and three in perfect unity, that is how you go fast. So this is you. You are a capper. You spawn somewhere near this base or behind it if it's tribes three. You use your jets, you use your jets to go up and then gravity to pull you down. If you hit this slope at an equitable angle and you activate your boots, we'll, we'll say skiing, you activate your boots, then you've used your resource to go up, your regenerating resource, your jets to go up you use gravity to carry you down, and because you have frictionless boots, you are going to convert that into energy, velocity. This makes you go fast. So you're gonna ski, and then right when you start going up again, depending on the tribes game, it can be a little bit different when you wanna start doing this, but this is where you start jetting again. And in general, you're gonna to wanna to jet, say, roughly this much, and then you're gonna to wanna to come down another hill, and then grab the flag, and then do that same process to get home. Now, the way that the maps are made and the way that the physics work in Tribes 3 is fairly different to previous Tribes games. In previous Tribes games, you generally want to hit the downslope at the top and ski down. But in Tribes 3 is, is very, if you're late to class, dude, I'm gonna send you to the principal's office if you're late again to solo. Thanks for the follow, bro. In Tribes 3, the physics are much more forgiving than other Tribes games. Because in other tribes games, you really want this touchdown to be like super smooth. You want to be matching as closely as you possibly can the angle of that hill. In this game, it's a lot more forgiving, as DeSolo knows. Instead of wanting to go down the steepest hill, you don't necessarily need to do that. You can actually go down this hill. I think it's actually good that skiing is a bit more forgiving in this game. I really that there's no fall damage. I don't like... Like, I never realized this, but fall damage is kind of anti-fun in other tribes games, in my opinion. This is basically the fundamentals of skiing. Use your regenerator resource with jets to go up, convert that into velocity by using gravity to go down, then maintain that velocity with your frictionless boots and repeat over and over until you're going really fast. One, one problem, one issue with tribes three in particular is that this is hard to show because I would need to show it from like a top-down angle. Okay, I'm gonna do top down again. One of my issues with this game, and to a lesser extent, Tribes Ascend versus earlier Tribes games, is it can be very difficult to change your lateral momentum. Meaning, while you're in the air, if you're going fast in one direction, it can be quite difficult to alter that direction without losing a lot of speed. In previous Tribes games, all you had a lot more air control, and you could use the train oftentimes to redirect yourself a lot more effectively. That's because there was a lot of small bowls all around the map and the way the physics worked was different. In this game, F, st F stands for flag. In this game, if you're like, oh my God, I found this amazing hill here. I'm going down the slope, jetting way up, going down the slope, I'm cruising. And all of a sudden you're here and you're like, oh, I missed the flag stand by a mile. I'm just gonna draw circles to represent a hill. So you go down this hill, you jet up, you go down this hill. This is the best way that I've found a cap so far in Tribes 3. You go up another hill, and while you're in the air, imagine I ski up, I ski down this first bowl, 
I ski up this hill. While I'm in the air, I see this hill. And then, so while my, I am going very high, but my lateral velocity is low. That is when you have the best chance to redirect yourself in this game. This is not like other tribes games. This is similar concepts can be used in other tribes game. This is slightly different in this game. And I know this is, bear with me. This is, I feel like this is, I don't know if this is making sense. Does this make sense to you guys? Am I making sense? Okay. So you go down into a bowl, you ski up your first hill, you go down the other side, then you go up this second hill, you get a lot of height. Actually, hold on. I should do dotted lines for when you're in the air versus when you're skiing. So you ski into a bowl, you go up a hill. Wait, dotted line is in the air, yeah. You go up and then you go down, you're skiing, and then here's another, and then you go way up to this hill, and then you start skiing again and then grab the flag and get home. In other tribes games, you would generally be able to like go down this hill and then just, your route would look more like this. But in this game, it looks more like this and then you go way up and then you go down this way. That's just, I'm no expert, but yeah, this is one of my biggest annoyances with capping in this game <laughs> is the lack of ability to change your lateral momentum when you're moving quickly laterally. This means that a lot of the time, I'll, I'll do a side view of this here. A lot of the time you like ski into your first bowl, you go up and then you go way up. And then that's, this is where you change your lateral velocity, not anywhere else. This is getting ugly as fuck. I'm so sorry. Thanks for the follow fuzzy lumps. Did any of that make sense? Did all of that make sense? Should have took notes from the successful franchise T2 or T T1 or T2, what a shame. I'm glad they're trying new stuff. I, I'm glad they're trying new stuff. I don't love the physics in T3, but I don't hate it either. I've had a lot of fun. A lot of fun in this game. Trying to stop a capper in this game is laughable when there is lag. Yeah, netcode needs some work. It's K, a bit of ugly is important. I think true. My favorite so far is finding a good sharp bowl, which there are like 2% of in each map. Yes. I think you can use bowls in this game to redirect your velocity but there just aren't very many bowls. I mean, this, this is where Greth comes in. In Tribes 1, Tribes 1 had very unique physics because you jumped, it, it wasn't frictionless boots, it was constant jumping. If you see this in Tribes 1, if you hit this at the right angle, you just went flying. Tribes 1 physics were, were something else. And you could definitely re redirect yourself with a single vertice, you could re redirect yourself. In midair, there's bowls all over the place that you can use to redirect yourself. Tribes 3, frankly, the maps don't feel like a lot of effort was put into them. I don't know. I, I don't want to be rude, but they just seem like, oh, a mountain here, a mountain there, blah, 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 blah. When I was designing Tribes Vengeance maps, I used to create uh, community, community maps in Unreal Editor for Tribes Vengeance. I would try, even though the physics didn't really work that well for using these little mini bowls. I tried to create as many little bowls as possible around the map. So you, you could use those to create new routes on the fly. That was one of my favorite. This is one of the most sick, awesome parts. And also one of the parts that sucks about Tribes 1 because it's just, the physics can be so punishing. If you hit the, if you hit a bowl or a vertice or whatever, just slightly incorrectly, it can be so, so punishing. But a game like Stonehenge and Tribes 1, it's got this really, really jagged terrain and giant, giant bowls that you can use, which means almost nobody ran the same exact route. Everyone had their own little custom route. There's practically infinite routes that you could run in Tribes 1 on most maps. Tribes 3, there's a lot less creativity. Generally use this hill, generally use that hill, and then come down this way to redirect yourself. We have a video from DeSolo. I've been spending a lot of time and effort and brain power trying to cut my stream highlights into consumable YouTube videos. I am going for YouTube monetization this year. If anyone hasn't subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, it would mean a lot to me if you did. We're on the way, man. We have a thousand public, we have a thousand watch hours. We need to get up to 500 subscribers though.